You may be seated. None like Jesus. No one ever loved me like Jesus did. No one's ever cared for me like Jesus. He's the one who saved me, saved you. He's the one who holds you in the palm of his hand. He's the one who provides for you. He's the one who cares for you. He's the one who gave you his Holy Spirit. He's the one who promised that he's coming again. He's the only one. He's the only Lamb of God. The only perfect one. The only living God. He's the only one. You can't talk to anybody else that will help you like Jesus. No one alive. No one dead. No one. There is no other God. There's no one. But there is Jesus. Sticketh closer than a brother. There is Jesus who is as close as the, the song says as a mention of his name. There is Jesus who is present with us, never leaving us nor forsaking us. Very present help in our time of need. We're in his presence this morning. It's good to see all you. I see your smiling faces. But there's nothing like being in the presence of Jesus Christ. Nothing like knowing that he cares for us. No matter what. No matter what's going on today, Jesus is here. He's present with us. He's promised to be with us. Praise God. Don't worry about the weather. Just a thing. This is New England. Don't worry about I'm not a weatherman, but uh, from what I can gather, don't worry about tonight. Come to church. No reason to stay home. Don't worry about it. We're going to be okay. We're going to dismiss the little ones to Children's Church. And anybody else who wants to leave. This morning, I'm just going to read one verse of Scripture. You might as well remain seated. Just, uh, it's found in Genesis chapter 19. I'm going to read the verse of Scripture, and then I'll tell the story. Genesis chapter 19, verse 26. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. In the book of Genesis, we read the story of Lot. Lot is Abraham's nephew. They're traveling together, but because of their families and because of their herds and because of the population, the land is not uh, big enough to, to handle both of them, and so they, they divide. And Lot takes his family, and they go um, to Sodom. First he pitches his tent toward Sodom, and then he winds up in the city of Sodom. Sodom is an evil city. It is a, uh, it's where we get our term sodomites from and sodomy. It's a vile, filthy city. And God tells Abraham, I'm going to judge that city. I'm going to come and I'm going to destroy that city. And Abraham intercedes. Lord, if there's 50, if there's 40, he goes down to 10. If there's 10 righteous people, would you spare the city for 10? And God says to Abraham, Lord, uh, Abraham, if I find 10 righteous people, I'll spare the city for the 10. And he sends the two angels there to uh, warn Lot and uh, to get Lot and his family up out of the city. The Bible says that they tarried, that Lot and his family were not prepared to go. His sons-in-law laughed at him, uh, said that he was nuts, and, uh, and they refused to go. The, angel takes, the angels take the Lot and his wife and, and daughters by their hands and, and takes them up out of, Lot, uh, out of Sodom, rescues them from that vile and filthy place and tells them, do not look back. Do not look back. Well, last week we spoke about vision. We talked about heavenly vision and, and receiving vision from God. We talked about how uh, vision is given to the spiritual that we can't have spiritual vision unless we are spiritual beings. That the things of God, the things of the Spirit, are spiritually discerned. Only those who are in relation with God and have His Spirit present within will understand the things of God and things of the Spirit. We have to have 
uh, spiritual vision to know what God desires of us and what he's doing with us. Well, I want to tell you this morning that to follow a vision, it is imperative that we don't look back. Vision is forward looking. Vision is always forward looking. Now, there's a time for looking back. There's a time when we look back in reflection. You know, there's nothing wrong with occasional glancing backwards to reflect on things. When, you know, when I build something, um, when I make something, when I paint a room, when I clean the garage, when, any of those things, I, I, you know, I stand back and I admire my work, don't you? I go back and I visit every now and then to say, yeah, it's pretty good, I, things pretty nice. I look at things that I made and, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. It's okay to reflect on things, to see your progress, you know, to admire uh, your work. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's, it's okay to look back in praise and in worship, to count your blessings, to remember where you were when Christ came to you. When you first acknowledge Jesus as Lord of your life and Savior of your soul. It's okay to look back from time to time to remember from whence you came and, and to count your blessings. To, to thank God for what he's done. The Bible tells, us, tells the Israelites to remember the rock from whence you are hewn and the hole of the pit from whence you are digged. It's okay to look back to say, I remember I remember where I was when Jesus came into my life. I, and to look back in praise and thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, that you rescued me from that spot, from that place. It's okay to look back, to, to judge and to acknowledge your forward progress. Let me ask you this. Have you grown this past year? Could you, when you look back just to, to see your progress, could you, could you acknowledge uh, growth? In, is there some... New, not new, but is there some spiritual truth that you have learned this past year or, or years? Do you follow me? Could, could you, in looking back, in, to, just to chart your progress, is there something that, that's happened even in this past year where you could say, God has, has moved me further along, I've grown, I've learned, I'm on, my, I'm on, I'm on forward progress? Is there? See, that's important for us to be able to do. We look back. It's okay to look back in that respect, to say, you know what, I look back at last year, and I see that from then till now, um, God has brought me through some things, and I've learned some things, and I've, I've become stronger and hopefully wiser because of it. In that respect, friends, there's, not, there's nothing wrong in the occasional glance backward. But we can't continuously be looking backward or we'll never make forward progress. Amen. If we live in the past, if we're always looking back, remember when. Uh, or, or, we're constantly looking backward at things that happened, at places we were, and we're looking at those things. We'll never make forward progress. We cannot live looking backwards. The Word of God tells us to not look back. I know I've said this many times, but there are, on the side of the Alps in Switzerland, there's a little cemetery, and there is a gravestone, the gentleman's name, and it says, he died climbing. Now, obviously, he was a mountain climber on the Alps in Switzerland, and he died in the progress of his climb. But wouldn't that be great that it, that it could be said of us when the time comes? <laughs> he died or she died climbing? I want that on my epitaph. Make a note of that. I want that. He died climbing. She died climbing. Friends, we must be on a forward progress, always climbing, always moving forward. When we stop, when we give up, when we say, that's as far as I want to go, I don't want to climb any higher, I don't want to go any further, then we're done, we're finished. Forward progress, friends. Vision is always forward. It's never looking back. We shouldn't look back. In running, they tell you, if you're going to run a race... Don't ever look back. Don't, don't worry about the guy behind you. If there's anybody you should be concerned with, be concerned with the person ahead of you and try and, and overtake them. Don't, be, don't concern yourself with what's behind. Don't look back at how far you've already come. What happens? You're going to trip over yourself. Look forward. Look ahead. Don't, in running, never look back. In climbing, never look down. 
Don't look down. It'll, it, you'll be discouraged, you'll be fearful. You always look up, always look forward, never look back. This message is for those who have recently, fairly recently come to Christ. You, you know, you're, you're just coming out of a world of, of sin and uh, there's that tendency when we first get saved to say, is this really the way I want to go? Am I really in this? Is this right? Is this, is this Christianity thing really, you know, and, and so we have a tendency to look back at where we just came from. It's also for those of us who have been on the way, hopefully on the way and not in the way, for a period of time, for a long time, you, because we, we get nostalgic sometimes, and we start to dream about, about how things were. You know... There's a thing about our memory. We never really remember very accurately. You, you can never really see. Why? Because vision is always forward. You were not supposed to be looking back. This message, I guess, in that respect, then, is for all of us. First of all, remember Lot's wife. Jesus tells us this. He, it's a warning he gives himself. In Luke chapter 17, in verse 32, Jesus says, Remember Lot's wife. Now Jesus is speaking of his second coming in that context of Luke chapter 17. When we talk about the second coming of Christ, what so often comes to our mind is the rapture. We think of him coming in the clouds. The second coming for most evangelicals is twofold. He's going to come. Friends, I believe soon, I believe very soon, Jesus is coming in the clouds. Let me just turn that back up on. He's coming in the clouds. I see, I see the, uh, the prophecy being fulfilled. I see the times in which we live. And I believe in the not too distant future. I don't know how long. Perhaps in our lifetime. Maybe sooner than that. <laughs> the trump of God is going to sound. There's going to be a shout from heaven. The Lord is going to descend into the clouds. And he's going to call his church, his bride. The, the dead in Christ, those who died in faith, are going to rise first to meet him in the air. Then we which are alive and remain, the church, will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And, and so shall we ever be with him. We're going to enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And for seven years we'll enjoy that time of celebration. While here on earth is the great tribulation. Times of suffering that the world has never known before, never will see again. A, a, a terrible time. And after the seven years, Jesus is going to return to the earth physically, lay, uh, uh, touching the Mount of Olives. It's going to split in two. And, he, and from there, he's going to enter into his thousand-year reign, the millennial reign of Christ. We know this. When, so when we talk about the second coming, this is, this is what Jesus is referring to, the, the, the whole thing, when we talk about his second coming. And in this context of the rapture and the tribulation and the judgment in, in his second coming. In all of these things, Jesus is talking in, in, in Luke chapter 17. And he says to his disciples, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. And then judgment came. He said, just like it was in the days of Lot, so it will be in the coming of, of the Lord. What was it like in the days of Lot? They were eating, they were drinking, they were giving to Mary, they were building. They were, in other words, he was saying it was, they were just going through their normal routine of life. Nothing out of the ordinary. It, uh, they, they had not expected this to happen. And when, when the angels came, they rejected their message and, and they, just, they just assumed everything was going to be as it was yesterday. And they were projecting it will be the same tomorrow. And right in the middle of this, the judgment of the Lord comes and the fire and the brimstone are poured out upon Sodom and Gomorrah and the two cities are burned to a crisp and they no longer exist. Jesus said, just like in the days of Lot, so it will be in the coming of the Lord. In other words, friends, life will be going on in its normal routine. When the Lord comes for his church, it will be without prior warning, other than what the prophets have said. 
We know what prophecy has told us about the last days, and so we should all be on guard. We should be like the, 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 the five wise virgins. Our, our lamps are, are filled with oil and burning. You, you, you follow me? You know, paid up, prayed up, ready to go up. We should be watching and alert for his coming. We should, the church should never be caught off guard. The Bible says that he'll come in a day when they think not. That should never be true of the church. Listen to me. I think the Lord could come today. And if he doesn't come today, I think he could come tomorrow. And if he doesn't come tomorrow, I think he'd come. To, you follow me? We should live our lives ready at the, at the instant that the trump sounds. We're ready to go. We should never be caught off guard. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, people will be going through their normal routine of life, not expecting anything out of the ordinary, and Jesus will come. And he'll call his church out. The same thing will hold true in the time of his judgment, in his second return. People will be living their lives, and Jesus will come. But notice this. Can I just point one thing out to you? That um, in the middle of, that, of, this, of this normal routine in Sodom, when people are just living their lives according to the routine... And judgment comes. Did you notice something first? God removes Lot and his family out before the judgment comes. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture partly because of this, verse, this, this story and many other reasons. But before his wrath is poured out upon the sinners, he removes his righteous. The Bible says it. Although Lot vexed his righteous soul uh, in seeing and hearing the ungodly acts of the wicked, Peter tells us, he was still righteous. God still removes his righteous before he pours out his wrath. And so we see a picture here of the days of Lot. Jesus said, but, but he, he reminds them, he's saying, uh, Jesus is saying, remember Lot's wife. When the angels came and took Lot and his family, his, his, his wife and his children, out of Sodom before uh, they, could, they could pour out the, uh, his wrath, he tells them, uh, don't look back. Remember, he, he, the angels tell them, don't look back. When you get out of Sodom, run and keep on running and don't look back. The Bible says that, Lot's wife looked back. Genesis 19, 17, the angel said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. When you get out of Sodom, stay out of Sodom. When you're out of Sodom, don't look back or you will be consumed. Don't look back. Keep running and run as far from Sodom as you possibly can. Friends, Sodom to us represents sin. Well, it represents sin if, if you spend any time and don't. Thinking of the sins of Sodom, it was a cesspool. And, and it's a picture of our lives before Christ. When we were in sin, in the world, going through the routines of the world, we were in vile sin and God rescued us. And he tells us, don't look back. Don't look back to Sodom. Don't look back to your sinful life for any reason at all. Well, why? Why should we not look back? Why? We don't know why she didn't look back. It doesn't tell us exactly. We can speculate. I don't often like to speculate on the Word of God because I want to know hard facts. But uh, can we speculate for just a moment? Why do we look back? Why, why do we... Well, sometimes we look back at our past successes. Like I said, I like to look back and admire the things that I've done. I like to admire my progress. Sometimes we live in the past. When we think about our, the success of our, our lives, we look, we look backwards. We, um, you know, think about this. They, the Lot family had accomplished um, a lot. <laughs> no pun intended. I, had accomplished much. Uh, Lot comes, he's, um, he's a nobody, he's a sojourner. 
he and his family, they are, they are just travelers through. They come to this city called Sodom, and they establish their family there. But the Bible says that Lot sat at the gate of Sodom. Biblical times, it was the city council, the city leaders that would sit at the gate. That is a, that is a reference to leadership, normally speaking. The, the council would meet at the gate. They were the gatekeepers of the city. And so we see very possibly that Lot, although he was nobody when he got to the city, now because of the blessings of Abraham, God's promise to Abraham, Lot now becomes a, a, a somebody in the city, an official in the city, very possibly. Lot's wife could have been looking at the success. We live in a fine, fancy home here. We're, we're, we're somebody here. People look to us. Look at, look at all that we've accomplished. We've got lots of friends. We've climbed the ladder, as it were. But friends, we can't live in the past. We can't live on past successes. When I was in Germany... Uh, I got to travel around a, a lot looking at churches and visiting churches. And there was one church, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the town. But in, um, it was a, one of those large cathedrals, one of those large stone buildings, you know, beautiful old churches. And uh, the tour guide that was taking us through the church said, you know, this church was an Assemblies of God or Finksgemeinde, Buddhist Finksgemeinde, German Assemblies. And... Um, and he was telling us how in 1927, when the Spirit descended upon Germany, you know, like our, uh, you know, Azusa Street, it was in that church in 1927 that the Holy Spirit was poured out and, and Pentecost came to that church and Pentecost spread throughout Germany as a result of the outpouring of the Spirit upon that church. And, and they're, they're so proud of, to tell us about what happened in 1927 in the outpouring of the Spirit in this church in Germany. Problem is, not much happened since. And now if you look at Germany, there's less than 1% that are evangelical believers, let alone spirit-filled. So all that happened in 1927, although it's admirable history, it makes no difference today. You, you can't live in what happened in 1927, and you can't live in what happened in your past. And so looking back at what we think was so great, you might have accomplished much, but that's in the past. You know, please forgive me for saying it, but I just love the expression, used to bees don't make honey today. Nothing of the past is effectual today. And so she may have looked back at her past successes. We can't live in the past, friends. Sometimes we look back at our past failures. When I think of some of the stupid things I've said and done, I cringe. You know, uh, I look back in my years, in my youth. Oh, God, help me. I look back at some of the mistakes I made. Have you made mistakes? Sometimes we look back at those things and we, and we feel the pain and the shame of the stupid things we did as we were growing. It might not even be that long ago. Well, we've done things that were foolish and we've made mistakes and, and, uh, and we look back sometimes at our mistakes. We, we, we tend to live there in the past. Well, friend, somebody once told me that failure is not falling down. Failure is failing to get up when you're given the chance. Because the truth of the matter is we will all fail. A failure, by the way, can I tell you, a failure is an event. It is not a person. Right? Nobody is a failure. People have failed, but a failure is an event. It's a, it's a thing that takes place. It's not a person. And, and, and failure, true failure takes place, not when you fall, but when given an opportunity and you refuse to get up. Now that's a failure. But we're all going to stumble, and we've all fallen. See, failure, friends, is the path of least persistence. Just take it as it is. I've fallen, I've fallen, I can't get up. <laughs> Refusing to get up. It's a matter of perspective. I know I've shared this with you before. You know all these things. There's nothing I'm telling you that's new. But we want to remember, you know, Babe Ruth's uh, record. Babe Ruth, 
Um, does he still hold the record in the American League for home runs? Okay. Well, he did for a long time. We look at his record as the, as the home run king. We look at all the great things. I, I had printed out all the things that he did, all the titles that he won, all the awards that he had received. We look at Babe Ruth, you know, uh, Sultan of Swing, incredible things. But to get there, Babe Ruth also held the record for strikeouts in the American League. In 1918, 1923, 1924, 1927, and 1928. Don't focus. We don't focus on, on the failures of the past. We focus on the successes of the past in that respect. You can't live on... on. Listen, Silly Putty was invented in New Haven, Connecticut, by the way. Did you know that? In World War II. Uh, because of the war effort, they needed rubber for the tires of the vehicles, and there wasn't enough. There was rubber drives, tire drives, you know, all that... And the scientist, is, he's, he's trying to help the, the, the war cause, and he's looking to create a rubber, a synthetic rubber, so they don't have to rely upon the rubber trees and the whole process. And, and so if we can create a synthetic rubber, you know. And so he creates this, this thing that, I mean, you roll it in a ball, it bounces like, a, like nothing you've ever seen. But as far as, you know, putting it on cars, it's a failure whole thing is scrapped. It's a failure. I mean, this guy spent time and effort, and it was a total failure. But who hasn't played with Silly Putty? <laughs> and copied the colors, you know, comic strips, and stretched them out. You know, who hasn't done that? Billions of dollars, multi-billions of dollars were sp ha have been spent on Silly Putty. A failure, but became quite successful. Uh, how about uh, post-it glue? Post-it glue. The guy set out to develop a super glue that would bond like steel. Post-its. You could, you could move it, take it, and stick it a hundred, hundreds of times. It, it's, it's not very super, is it? A failure. Complete and absolute failure. And yet, 3M has made billions of dollars on post-it notes and post-it note glues and post-it this and post-it that. <clears throat> Failure. Uh, you ever hear of a guy named Thomas Edison? Created the light bulb. Over 9,000 failed experiments before he was successful in the light bulb. Now, we could dwell on failure. I mean, time after time after time after time after time after time after time. You could stay there. Or you could keep on going in, until you get the light bulb. Until the light bulb. How about, of a, how about, you ever hear of a young man named Michael Jordan? Poor kid. Michael Jordan was cut from his high school basketball team due to lack of talent. Poor kid. Wouldn't let him play basketball in high school because he didn't have any talent. Feel sorry for him. <clears throat> One of the greatest, if not the greatest, basketball player that ever played the sport. And I can go on and on and on, friends, about failure. Don't, don't, let, don't look at failures in the past. You've got to move. Vision, vision is forward. What, what else? We sometimes look back at, at our past hurts and disappointments. Life is disappointing. We, owe, we set ourselves up. The more we dream, the more we, uh, vision we have, the more opportunity there is for disappointment. That's a fact. We, but we live, we, we'll never know victory if we're not willing to face the disappointments. Disappointments come. Hurts come. Trust me, I, I know. Uh, it does. I, 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 I've told you before, and I, I hesitated whether I should say this again, but I've been told, I was told by my own pastor at one point in time that I would never pastor an Assemblies of God church as long as he lived, and he would see to it personally. And yet when I was ordained, it was my pastor that prayed for me in my ordination. I had a district superintendent, you think I'm a, you really think I'm a loser now, district superintendent that said he would never recommend me for a church in his district, this district. I'm a pastor of, of this church in, in this district. Oh. 
get it. understand the point. I had a very famous, a world famous TV evangelist <laughs> tell me that I was ignorant. So ignorant. I didn't know I was ignorant. I was too ignorant to be ignorant, and I couldn't open up a door without somebody showing me how. Now, that still might be true. I can't. <laughs> the point is, you will be disappointed. You will be hurt. People will hurt you. Sometimes marriage is a disappointment. You head into the thing expecting, you know, the honeymoon to last forever, and it doesn't always. And sometimes it fails, and sometimes people have even gone through divorce. I can't imagine divorce. I can't imagine the heartache when the Bible says the two become one flesh and now they're ripped apart. I can't. I, my heart goes out to you. You say, we tried to make it work. I wanted to make it work. It was never our intention. And you sit with the hurt of that. But we could look back at the hurts and we could look back at the disappointments of those things. Friends, but listen, you have two opportunities. You could lay down and die. Or you could keep on going. You could live in the past and in the hurt and constantly think about those things and not go forward. Or you could get up, dust yourself off and say, by God's help and God's grace, I'm going forward. My vision is forward looking, it's not behind. Listen, sometimes we look back at our past sins. God knows we sit and sometimes in our private shame when we think about some of the sinful things we've done. You, some things you would never tell anybody because they were just too, too shameful. And we sometimes look back at our private shame. The Bible tells us, the prophet Micah tells us, and thou, God says, I will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. God says he's going to take, he'll take our sin. He has. He's taken our sin and he's cast it into the depths of the sea. In fact, um, the sin, we say, the, 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 the sea of his forgetfulness. Uh, he said that he would remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. That's from point to point. That's eternity east to eternity west. He separates our sin from us. Jesus said that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Our sins of the past are in the past. Don't look at those. They don't count anymore. Amen. In fact, God says, what sin? Whatever are you talking about? He chooses to forget. Somebody said he forgets to remember and he remembers to forget. Our sin. Our sin. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part but the whole, has been nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. I don't know why we look back what's wrong with looking back well it makes us ineffective in the future galatians chapter 4 and verse 9 the apostle paul says but now after that you have known god or rather are known of god how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage paul's writing to the, to the churches of Galatia who had become Judaized again. They, uh, they had come out of the law, the bondage of the law, to find Christ. And now they were going back under the law, under the bondage of the old legal bondage sinful lives. And, uh, and Paul is saying, now that you have known God, or have been known by God, what is it? Why would you go back to the things of the past? Can we make application here for a minute? Think about Israelite, the Israelites. And they, when they came out of Egypt, they came out of bondage. And they, they had gone only a short distance into the wilderness. And they ran into hard times. There's no water. Uh, there's no food. You know, they, and, and so they begin to murmur, they begin to complain, and they, they cry out to Moses, why did you take us out of Egypt? It was so much better there. We had leeks and garlic. Onions and garlic. Not bad to spice your food, but if that's your diet, stay away. <laughs> leeks and garlic, and you know, we had it made in Egypt. Oh, oh, you did. Do you remember the whips across your back 
when you didn't make bricks fast enough. And you didn't fulfill the desires of the Egyptians, the hard taskmasters. Do you? No, we so often forget what it was like in our lives of sin. Do, do you remember? Don't, I can't say this without making you think about the past, but wasn't there a time when God came into your life and removed you out of that filth? Do you remember the place? Do you remember? We tend to forget the loneliness and the fear that we had and the shame and the pain of our past lives. God has, in his grace, has removed that so far from us that we shouldn't dwell there indeed and we're free from that. But, but to, to, be, to forget about it to the point that we, we look only to the good of the past, the, the pleasure we had in Egypt. No, we were slaves to sin, in bitter bondage to sin. Do you remember, friends, the place from whence you came? We've forgotten the dungeons of sin. Was there not a day, my brother or sister, when, when you fell to your knees and said, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Rescue me from this filth of my sin. Brought out of darkness into his marvelous light. What, what is there possibly back there that we would ever look for and long for? What, could we, what is there in the world that's, that's possibly an attraction to us? This next statement is not for everyone, okay? So don't get mad at me. If, if the shoe fits... Wear it. But I could prove to you from Scripture that you're not walking in the will of God. I can prove to you from Scripture that, you, uh, that you're out of step with God and yet you shed no tears. And yet you don't flee. You remain unmoved and unaffected by his word. I, I could show you clearly from scripture that you're not living right. The message is preached, to Sunday school is taught if you go to Sunday school. And, and the word is absolutely clear about what God requires and about where you live. And still you're unmoved and you're unchanged and you, and you, go, you go on your way. Question, have you already become a pillar of salt? Have you become so hardened in your, in your life and in your heart that you won't be changed? What happens when we look back, we become indecisive. This is for everybody. Bringing you all back in. We become indecisive. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verses 61 and 62, And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Lord, I'll follow you, but can I just go home and, and, and tell the folks? And Jesus says, No. So that's harsh. Isn't that a reasonable request? I just want to go home. I just want to say, Hey, my dad, folks. I'm leaving, I'm going to follow Jesus. Isn't that reasonable? But that's not the intent here. What Jesus, Jesus read their hearts, he saw their hearts. What, what they were saying in essence is this, let me go and talk it over with those at home. Let me go talk it over with my family. I'm going to go tell my family I'm following you and I'm going to get their approval. And then when I get their approval, I'll come and follow you. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. If you're not ready, if your heart does not tell you to follow me, then don't follow me. Once you put your hand to the plow, you can't look back. Don't ask if him. I don't know about you, but when I came to Christ, uh, if, the, if we had taken a vote, the vote would have been against following Jesus. All my family. I was a, a rotten sinner, rebel, filthy chief of sinners. And... Uh, and everybody was like, oh, you know, you know Mark, we've got to worry about him a little bit. We're praying for him, you know, but he still goes to church, you know, hey, okay, you know, I hope he straightens out his life. And I gave my life to Christ and I was gloriously saved, washed in the blood of the Lamb, filled with his spirit. I know Jesus, I love Jesus, I follow Jesus. I turn from all the filth of my life, going to church as, as often as the doors are open, and now my family's worried about me. 
Oh, what happened to him? Oh, he fell off the deep end. Oh, he's one of them Jesus freaks. They're not going to approve because they don't understand. Jesus said, you can't look back. Don't ask your family's approval. You either follow me or you don't. Will your family be against it? Yes. It's not a, they're not going to save you. Will you be disinherited? Perhaps. But you put your hand to the plow. It's about the kingdom of God. You're going forward. Listen. The person who looks back is, in, is a person of indecision. I will follow thee, but. I will follow thee, but not now. I preached a message years ago, an evangel, Assembly of God, um, Christ's last call, or Christ's final call. And it was a message about the Lord warning uh, of his return. And this is the last call that Jesus gives before he comes and be ready. I was working in the car business at the time. It was, I was uh, bivocational. Um, that's, a good, that's not a bad thing. It's not <laughs> bivocational, it's two vocations. And um, I was uh, selling cars. And it, I don't know how things are now, but the car business back in the 90s was, I mean, you're talking, you're talking pretty low. Drugs and deception and thievery. Um, you know, used car dealers get their reputation for a reason. That's all I'm going to say. Not all, but I'm just saying. And the finance manager who had claimed to have been born again, he he claimed to have been a Christian. He was backslidden. Um, but I uh, was talking to him about the Lord, and, and I brought him a copy of the message, the tape, uh, Christ's Last Call. I said, here, listen to this. This will, this will explain a lot of things to you. And so he goes out. He, he's going home that day. And he plugs it into his car. He's going to listen to the message, Christ's Last Call. But I had made a mistake when I copied it, and the tape was blank. No. It was the greatest sermon I never preached. He came in the next day white as a ghost, and he said it was profound. Christ's last call, and I missed it. God used that to speak more to him than any sermon I've ever preached. I can't tell you that he came to Christ as a result, but God knows what he's doing. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'll follow you, but not now, people say. I'll follow you, but not right. I'll follow you, but not publicly. I, I don't know about all that witnessing stuff. I'm, you know, I, I'm a secret saint. I just let my lifestyle, you know, speak the gospel. Well, you know, that's a part of it. But as a witness... I've called you to the witness stand. Could you, could you tell me what you've seen and heard? Ain't much of a witness, is it? You got to say something. You got to tell them. And so Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. I'll follow you, but, but, but not publicly. I'll follow you, but it's got to be private. Paul said in Philippians, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting the things of the past, success, failures, disappointments, heartaches, hurts, sin, forgetting the past, none of that matters. Forgetting all the things that lie in the past, I look to the future, I press on, I strive towards uh, the, the prize of, of the high calling in, in Christ Jesus. We don't look back. We don't look back. It's dangerous to look back. Both then and now. You know, you think about it, you, you got your oxen, uh, your mule, you got your plow, you know, the old plows. Um, the, the oxen pulled, but you had to keep that thing down in the soil and you had to keep it straight. Whole idea, when Jesus said, if you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. You, you if you, yeah, you look, you look backwards, 
to, to plow a field then and now with John Deere tractors, you, uh, you, you set a, a, a focal point in the, in the distance in, ahead of you, and you stay aimed at that. You can't, you can't look anywhere else, so you'll go astray. You, you, to keep furrows straight, you aim, you look ahead. You're forward-looking. Vision is ahead, and you stay. Now, if you, if you look back, you're, you, it's dangerous to the animals. It's dangerous to yourself, to the equipment. You're, you know, you're, you're going to get fired. It's clearly not going to work for you. You can't look back. I was 14 years old, a couple of days before my uh, beginning of my freshman year in high school. Me and Bobby Nickel uh, were pedaling our bicycles down to buy bicycle parts down in Bridgeport. And we're coming back home. Chopsy Hill Road, uh, over the eight, uh, Route 8, Route 25 connector by Wonderland of Ice, for those of you who know my beautiful city of Bridgeport. And uh, you're, we're coming back, we're riding over the, the bridge, and um, I, I, I didn't see him, so I looked over to see where he was. And I ventured out into traffic. I got hit by a car. My, my arm was mangled, my hand broken. I was, I was all messed up because I looked back to see what was going on behind me. You, it's dangerous looking back. Don't look back. Look forward. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. It's a disqualifier when we look back. Thirdly, it compromises our faith. Listen to this. She had come out, Lot's wife, had come out of Sodom, out of sin. And, and on her way out, she's out of sin. She's free from sin. She's free from the wrath of God poured out upon sin. She's free. And she's on her way to Zoar, which is the refuge, this place of safety and rest and protection, the promised place where they could go and be safe. She's between Sodom and Zoar. And she stops. Out of Sodom, out of sin's grip, but halting before Zoar and turning back to look at Sodom. Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. He doesn't say, remember Abraham. Not in this context. He doesn't say, remember Abraham, that man of faith who always looked forward, who trusted me wherever he went. He doesn't say, remember Abraham. He doesn't re say, remember Isaac who redug the wells of his father. He doesn't say, remember Jacob, how he wrestled with me, uh, with the angel of the Lord until I changed him. And doesn't say, remember them. Who does Jesus tell us to remember? Lot's wife. Remember her. He's not talking to hypocritical scribes and Pharisees saying, you better remember Lot's wife. No, he's talking to his disciples. Peter, James, John, and others. Those who have come out of the world to follow him. And he's telling his disciples, remember Lot's wife. He's telling us this morning, remember Lot's wife. She looked back and she became a pillar of salt. This was an act of ingratitude. She had been spared from destruction. God rained his wrath upon that city. She deserved it just like everybody else deserves it. But God, God in his mercy, he removed her. Listen, and not of her own merit. She didn't deserve to, to be rescued. She didn't earn it. She didn't even accept it when offered. Here, listen to me. It wasn't, oh, I can't wait to get out of this. The angels had to take them by their hands and she came out of Lot, out of Sodom. She was dragged out by the grace and mercy of God. You hear me? Amen. It was the mercy of God and his grace that rescued her. She didn't deserve, Lot didn't deserve to be rescued. Nobody deserves to be rescued. God in his grace and mercy rescued her from her sin and from his wrath. And here she is spared destruction. But she didn't believe. She didn't believe the report. I know. You're sitting here saying, the weatherman said, we're going to get 8 to 12 inches. Or, or 8 to 10. Or 4 to 6. Wherever, whichever station you tune into. And you say, you know what? They said we're going to get like 35 feet last week. You know, I don't believe weathermen anymore. Well, you know, 
uh, sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. And, and here's this woman looking at the weather report. It doesn't, it doesn't see, seem like, uh, you know, uh, sulfur and brimstone uh, kind of weather to me. I, I don't believe the message. No. You know, this isn't going to happen. She doubted. She did not believe the message that, that came. Listen, friends, this is a generation that rejects the message by and large. Oh, there are some, but you could... I believe with all my heart, with all my heart. If you don't believe me, at least understand from my heart why I say what I say. That, the, that we are living in the last days, that the Lord is coming soon. I believe it. And, 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 the, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be caught up. And the world is going to go into terrible tribulation. I believe this with all my heart. And, and this generation, by and large... They reject the message of the rapture. Church or Christian organizations, evangelical organizations, are now beginning to rewrite their doctrine and, and, dis, and, and, uh, and disallow the theory, the, the, the doctrine, I should say, of the, uh, of the rapture. And they're preaching against it. No, this is, they're not, they don't believe in the rapture. And this generation, 20s and 30-year-olds, don't believe. And if there is a rapture, it's... We don't have anything to be concerned with. It'll never, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. They feel or sense no concern whatsoever for the day in which we live. Friends, listen. She did not believe what the, what the angels had said. She did not believe the report. She wasn't prepared in her own to come out. Who are these guys anyway? They pop in, tell us God's going to destroy us. I don't believe it. And many in this generation don't either. They don't believe when, when, when the Bible says don't look back. You've come out of Sodom. You've come out of that place. And, and, the, and remember Lot's wife. God says don't look back. Don't look back in, into, the, into the world of sin and shame and pain. Don't look back. Don't look at anything of the past. Stay on course. Look ahead. As I close, Jesus warns against looking back. He says, once you've put your hand to the plow, once you've accepted Christ and you're moving forward, you understand that he's calling you to move forward. If you look back, you're unfit for the kingdom of God because you become ineffective, become sidetracked. It's, it's dangerous to look back there. And it is definite, it's a definite act of disobedience. Now that you're saved, don't look back at the weak and beggarly elements. Don't look back at the sin of the world. Don't look back at the successes and don't dwell in the failures. Don't, there's nothing there for you. And to look there and to live there and to meditate on things of the past, it's, dis, it's disobedient to what God has called us to do. Some people feel conviction that they're, that they're not right with God. Uh, you know, and each day brings the, a sense of God's displeasure Listen, you're a soul that has been awakened by God. You, you, you run to grace and embrace his mercy. You know, look forward. Run, run to him. If you sense that, that, that you're not right with God, run to him and, and get right with God. Uh, some run to him, others run away. I don't believe this message. Some feel no conviction at all. But I ask you, if you could bring yourself to him today, run and don't look back. If you, could, if you could bring yourself to him today, get out of Sodom, run, and keep on running, and don't ever look back. Some feel no conviction at all. The Bible tells us that many times and in many ways that this life is to be a, spirit, a, a spiritual progress. We're, we're moving forward. We're to forget the past. We're to run the race. Uh, we're to have vision um, how can I encourage you this morning? As we close this sermon, this message, how can I encourage you this morning? How can I spur you on? What, what more could I say or do? When the Bible tells us that God has rescued us, He set us free, we're, we're out of Sodom, we're on our way to Zoar, we're looking forward, we're moving ahead, forgetting all that lies in the past, pressing on towards the mark of our high calling of God in Christ Jesus. 
Are you, are you prepared to do that? Put your hand to the plow and not look back. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word and for your spirit, Lord. The spirit of comfort, the helper, the paraclete. The one that has come alongside of us, Lord, to help us in our journey. I thank you, Lord, as we read in your word how you rescued Lot and his wife and his daughters from that vile place. You told them to not look backwards, to, to keep on going, to run and keep running all the way to Zoar. And you told us to remember Lot's wife because she looked back and she was destroyed. Help us, Lord, to take this to heart. You have saved us. You've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Lord, our vision is forward. Help us to, to not... Lord, there are some here this morning that are... Uh, they mourn the loss of the past. Places they've gone, things they've done, they were successful and now it seems to be so far behind them. Lord, I pray that you deliver them from thoughts of the past. They don't know. We don't know what lies ahead. We don't know what victories are before us. Lord, they, there are some that think about the past and, and, and they regret the failures. They live in the constant memory of how they failed. God, a failure is an event, not a person. Help them to see, Lord, that if they choose to get back up, you have things in store for us, Lord, that we can't even understand. There are those that are sitting here, Lord, they, they live in the hurt of the past. Disappointments, defeats, hurt, heartache. God, I pray that you would deliver them from those things, that you would pour in the oil and the wine, the balm of Gilead for their healing. Lord, that you would show them that, Lord, nothing of the past, Father, matters today or tomorrow. You are a very present help in time of trouble. That what they were and what they've done, it's under the blood of Christ. And now, today, Lord, you've called us to victory. God, I pray that you would help us to remember that our sin is forgotten. That we don't have to worry about our sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the holes nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. God, I pray that you would help each person who's heard this message and that it would be applied to their hearts as you desire. God, that we will move on from this place and we'll go on to victory. Be glorified, Lord, in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, church. Come out tonight. I want to talk. Well, the t my title is Come Holy Spirit, I Need Thee. Would you come out tonight?